And yeah, we're going to talk about how climate reparations are a key pillar of climate justice. Um, so first, I want to hear from you to write in the chat um, how you would define climate reparations. Um, and that's OK. It's totally fine if you don't have a good answer right now. Just kind of give it your best approximation or like some idea of, uh, of what you think climate reparations is. Well, a justice approach to the damage that climate change has caused to pay the climate debt owed from global north to global south. Funding and solutions to address loss and damage. Payment for historic and current loss and damage from the biggest emitters to those least responsible. Great. Um, all of these are really good um, answers, actually. And so maybe you guys can deliver the presentation. <laughs> um, yeah, so as you guys um, probably know around the world, the impacts of climate change are already being felt um, from typhoons in the Philippines to drought in Morocco to fires in Australia communities everywhere are being hit by extreme weather events like never before. Um, and these extreme weather events like hurricanes and gradual processes like sea level rise ruin houses, damage crops and destroy schools and hospitals. And the term loss and damage is used in international climate policy to refer um, to those impacts that go beyond what we can adapt to from climate change. Um, but loss and damage doesn't affect everyone equally. It hits hardest amongst those people living in poverty, particularly in the global South. Um, and researchers estimate that by 2030, the cost of loss and damage in the global South will be between 290 and 580 billion US dollars annually. Um, and this by 2050, this cost could rise to one to $2 trillion each year. And the damage is paid for mostly by people who lose their homes, um, their crops, and their livelihoods. Um, and increasingly, loss and damage is also leading people to leave their homes and communities. A lot of this migration will be internal. Um, that is, people moving from one part of their home country to another, often driven by crop failure and other extreme events, um, moving from uh, rural areas to cities. And a report by the World Bank estimates that by 2050, there could be more than 216 million internal climate migrants across, across the global south. Um, and still our governments are responding in an aggressive way. When people do want to migrate to another country, hostile immigration policies like those in the UK mean that there are not very many options for safe and legal migration when people are affected by climate disaster. And so far, no country recognizes climate change as a valid reason for claiming asylum. Um, and there's no legal recognition of climate refugee as an immigration category, um, despite growing recognition that climate change is creating a humanitarian crisis for people around the world making their homes and communities unsafe. Um, so some examples of this in Mozambique um, in 2019, uh, it experienced two catastrophic cyclones within the space of one month. Um, around 146,000 people were internally displaced. And even two years later, um, some of those people were still living in camps displaced from their homes. Uh, the cyclone and then the flooding that followed ruined um, a million acres of crops 
and damaged 100,000 homes um, and destroyed around a, a billion dollars uh, worth of infrastructure. Um, and Mozambique didn't really receive the help it needed to prepare for these events or to recover from them. Um, and like at least uh, 600, 700 people died from those impacts. In the Middle East, climate change is projected to cause an increase in heat waves and wildfires and a 25% uh, decrease in precipitation leading to droughts and water shortages. Um, but these impacts aren't felt equally. Um, even before the present uh, genocide in Palestine, climate change was exacerbating water shortages that were already happening because of the Israeli occupation. Um, in Gaza, Israeli restrictions on wastewater uh, treatment meant that 97% of water was unfit for human consumption, which was one of the leading causes of child mortality there. Um, and in the West Bank, Israel controls water resources, often denying Palestinians permits and equipment they need to build water infrastructure. So you can't really understand loss and damage without a critical lens on the underlying um, racist and colonial policies that drive inequality. That means some people feel the impacts more than others. And again, with this link of um, climate change and 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 its colonial roots um, in India in the 19th century, um, British colonizers kind of transformed the agriculture system, shifting it away from subs like small subsistence farming toward cash crops um, for export, and this created a famine that killed 29 million people. Um, and there's some researchers that estimate that Britain gained 45 trillion US dollars out of the colonial exploitation of India. And now India faces really severe impacts from climate change. Um, one report estimates that between 17 and 27 million people could be displaced by climate change in India alone. Um, all this while the average UK person, like person in the UK emits a lot more carbon than uh, the average person in India, um, ab about two to three times more than the average person now that the um, UK has started to reduce emissions and India has seen more economic growth. Um, so clearly there's this sense of injustice, there's the history of um, how colonialism has informed development and, um, and the unequal pollution um, and, and impacts of climate change. Um, and that brings us to the idea of climate reparations. Um, of course, it's vital that we continue to fight fossil fuel expansion and other polluting industries so that we stop uh, the loss and damage from occurring. Um, but we know it's already happening now and there's more warming um, that we've already kind of locked in due to um, not acting on climate change soon enough. Um, so we're asking what it would mean to live in a world where we work to like meaningfully repair the harm we've caused to others. Um, and that's where climate reparations comes in. It seemed like you guys had a pretty good handle on a, a general definition of climate reparations um, based on the things that you put in the chat in the beginning. There are some other places we can look for definitions of what reparations mean. Um, the UN actually has a definition of reparations that has five conditions that need to be met um, in order for it to constitute reparations. Mm. So the first is cessation, assurances, and guarantees of non-repetition, which basically means stop doing the harm and don't do it again. <laughs> um, the second is restitution and repatriation, which is returning things back to the way they were previously, uh, potentially returning stolen artifacts, for example, um, compensation, which is to pay for the damages suffered, satisfaction, which is to apologize and listen to the needs of uh, the people affected, and rehabilitation, which is like providing support services to people who are affected. Um, so this provides a more comprehensive definition, um, but we also still think this doesn't go far enough. Um, for example, the requirement of restitution 
that is returning things to how they were previously kind of ignores the fact that due to various forces of oppression, the previous situation might not actually be something people want to go back to anyways. Um, so in our view, reparations has to go beyond apologizing and writing a check um, for compensation. It, it has to contribute to undoing systems of global injustice. And so a meaningful vision of climate reparations requires transforming society so that it more um, deeply addresses the injustices faced by communities around the world and it, while also addressing the climate crisis. So it means dismantling these ideologies that say, um, you know, there's a social hierarchy where some people are better than others, or like we ha we as humans have domination over nature. Um, and climate reparations then could still mean direct compensation to people affected by disasters, but it could also mean that um, having a transition toward a world that met our full needs um, in an equitable way with healthcare, housing, disaster preparedness, and other social services for climate impacted communities as important starting points. Um, and I guess more ambitiously imagining a world where people had power, where there were no borders, where our needs were prioritized, and there was no longer a system of profit making that regarded communities um, as disposable. And we can imagine many different forms that reparations could take. Um, I think the important thing is that we do something to acknowledge and address the immense damages caused by climate change um, and the legacy of colonialism in the global south. Um, some of you might be familiar with this um, background on uh, loss and damage finance. So within the UN climate negotiations, uh, global South countries and climate activists are fighting for recognition of loss and damage that is already affecting their communities. Um, for uh, adaptation and mitigation, wealthy countries previously pledged 100 billion US dollars of climate finance um, each year to countries in the global South. Um, and um, researchers estimate that $100 billion goal wasn't met um, in 2020, and that a lot of this finance um, that was delivered came in the form of loans um, and development aid that got double counted. So it's not necessarily new money um, coming in. At COP27 in 2022, countries decided to establish the Loss and Damage Fund which would be paid for by Global North countries who are the largest historical contributors to climate change. And this, of course, was a big victory for campaigners and Global South countries who'd fought for over 20 years to have dedicated loss and damage finance. Um, and this year, we've seen some pledges into the fund, um, but the numbers have, uh, they've pledged fall enormously short of the amount of money that's needed. Um, for example, at COP28, the UK pledged 60 million um, pounds for the loss and damage fund, but that money isn't new or additional um, because it comes out of an existing climate finance pledge that was recently downgraded. Um, keeping in mind the number I mentioned earlier, the cost um, 290 to $580 billion annually by 2030. Um, so the annual costs already actually are in the hundreds of billions. Um, and overwhelmingly, these costs are still paid for by the poorest people in the world who did almost nothing to cause climate change. Um, and then there's governments who are already massively indebted from predatory predatory loans that were issued decades ago. And they don't have that like fiscal space to be able to uh, pay for loss and damage as it's happening. And so that I guess highlights the urgency of climate reparations and also a a, a broader definition of, of reparations than just what could fit inside of the loss and damage fund. Um, and it's also important to acknowledge that many movements have been calling for reparations for centuries. Um, reparations are longstanding core demand of racial justice movements to address the legacy of slavery and colonialism. In the UK, the Stop the Mangamizi movement has been calling for reparations for slavery and colonialism for decades. 
Uh, in the US, the movement for black lives has a comprehensive set of policy demands centering around reparative justice for communities affected by the legacy of slavery. Um, and the Caribbean community of countries, CARICOM has also demanded European countries provide reparations for indigenous genocide and slavery. Um, and there are also some examples of reparations that have been provided. Um, so for example, Germany provided reparations to survivors of the Holocaust and South Africa provided um, compensation to uh, survivors of the apartheid regime. Although um, in both of those situations, obviously the the compensation represented only a small amount of the people harmed and like didn't go far enough. Um, so yeah, there are some precedent for um, examples of reparations um, in specifically relating to uh, institutional racism um, and war. Um, so yeah, now that we kind of have a general overview and understanding, um, I'm kind of, I'd like to invite you to imagine what a world with climate reparations could look like. Um, some examples of where climate reparations should be applied, what reparations in different communities could like could look like, um, and to to think more broadly than just compensation to a specific group, like what a reparative approach to climate justice could look like on a societal scale. Um, and like say there was a wealth transfer, how it would reach people and communities in a transformative way rather than just reaching their governments. Um, and how, how could climate reparations consider the harms of colonialism and slavery, given, given that these like have compounding impacts that still affect people and what should be the role of the UK government and people in the UK to provide climate reparations. Um, now, normally here I would, um, oh yeah, someone asked in the chat, the UK, group that campaign around climate reparations. Well, um, so the the movement I mentioned on racial justice um, is uh, is called Stop the Mangamizi. Let me just see if I can put this in the chat. Um, yeah, and they actually, they had a, yeah, thank you. Um, they had a conference, um, a Pan-African reparation, reparations conference um, last year that was like bringing together movements, talking about the legacy of colonialism and slavery. Um, so yeah, normally at, at this point of the, um, of the conversation, we'd go into breakout groups. Actually, I think we can probably still do this because we can, we could just break out into two groups. Um, and basically there's two questions here. Um, the first step is to think of a concrete example of a community that is affected by loss and damage from climate change. So this might be a place that you kind of have ties with or something you've heard about in the news. And then secondly, to think about what climate reparations would look like for that community and for other communities. Um, so how would the how would they benefit? Who would provide the reparations? And what would you also not want reparations to look like? Um, so yeah, I'll um yeah, if we could, Louise, if you don't mind um putting into two um breakout groups and then um yeah. Uh if you could pick one person to report back, that would be great. I'm going to... How long do you want to give people in groups, Sadie? Yeah, I was just thinking about this. Um, usually I do 15 minutes, but I would maybe say a little bit oh, less. Now, so... Yeah, maybe like 10 minutes. 10 minutes. Okay. They're not huge groups anyway. I'll just put a timer on. Well, I'll just send a note so they've got 10 minutes. Thank you.
one thing that oh wait we're still recording maybe we can stop recording so um right now the uk and other wealthy governments are not particularly open to the idea of providing climate reparations um so we have a lot of work to do to push for our demands um at the climate reparations network we're uh working to build a movement for climate reparations in the uk we have a set of stop and start demands that represent our vision including to stop fossil fuel projects stop giving public money to polluting industries and to stop hostile migration policies as well as to start to make polluters like coal oil and gas companies pay climate reparations provide finance for loss and damage to meet the scale of the harms done, to invest in good green jobs in a just transition, to reverse cuts to overseas aid and promote debt relief and cancellation, and to give decision-making power to communities on the front line of health, climate, economic, and social injustice. Um, on the loss and damage side, the Make Polluters Pay Coalition is targeting the UK government to provide loss and damage finance. Um, and at a global scale, there's the Loss and Damage Youth Coalition that focuses on obviously youth action. Um, we need people, uh, more people fighting for climate reparations at all scales, all the way from our local climate action groups to the halls of the UN. Um, and you'll likely see more actions and campaigns in favor of climate reparations in the coming years. Um, but we need our movements, politicians, and the general public to engage more deeply with the topic if we're going to make progress. Um, and so for that reason, we really encourage all movements and activists to consider how climate reparations might be woven into their narrative and demands. Um, and so we have another breakout group um, discussion, and basically we're going to talk to um, how climate reparations relates to the work that we're already doing. Um, how can your specific campaigning or work integrate climate reparations into its demands? Um, might you consider, for example, hosting a solidarity action or speaking up about climate reparations in the media? Or um, are there new ideas or actions that could build momentum? Um, so we'll do these breakouts for another 10 minutes. And again, if you can pick someone to report back um, briefly, um, and we'll just maybe jump back, um, Louise, if we can, into the same breakout groups. Thanks. Um, can maybe start the recording again.